very much for the uh, kind invitation. Let me also thank the uh, Institute and Katrina in particular for inviting me and arranging my, my visit. And I thank all of you for, for coming out uh, for this lunch meeting. What, I, what I'm going to do, and I suspect that many of you have seen the reports of the proliferation of alleged attacks on U.S. interests. Uh, many of them have kind of spy novel, cloak and dagger, code names, Operation Aurora, Visiting Hades, Night Dragon, Shady Rat. <laughs> um, and these are a series of attacks on... Do you make those names? I don't make the <laughs> names. <laughs> McAfee makes up most of the names, or the U.S. government makes up many of the names. But um, what I'm going to try to do is put those attacks into a larger context, and in particular talk about how I see the competition between the United States and China in cyberspace, and, and through doing that, uh, illustrate what I think how U.S international strategy towards cyberspace is developing and talk a little bit about what the U.S. is doing domestically and internationally to, to, to try to shape this, this space. I, I hope to speak for about 25, half, 25 minutes, half an hour, and then turn over to Q&A. And what I'm going to do is talk about Chinese and U.S. interest in cyberspace, talk a little bit more specifically about what I see the motivations for Chinese attacks, uh, talk about how the U.S. is responding illustrate what I think a possible agreement with China was going to look at, look like, which I think is going to be very, very narrow uh, and very limited. Uh, and then I'll talk about why things might get better, but you'll see my heart's not really into it. So um, I'm going to leave you on a rather pessimistic note. So let me start off with U.S. interest. And uh, as was mentioned before, the U.S. now has clearly stated its interest in cyberspace and the international cyberspace strategy. It says the U.S.'s interest is in a cyberspace that is open, secure and global, uh, open, secure and global. I think the Chinese share maybe one and a half of those. Uh, open, we all clearly know. Uh, the Chinese have a very extensive system of internet filtering and censorship in place, uh, both on a technology side through what's known as the Great Firewall, but also through uh, intermediary liability. So the Chinese ISP providers are responsible for censoring their users, uh, and you can see that happening now with Weibo, the Chinese Twitter-like platform where they are now actively engaging uh, in censoring some very heavy users, uh, but also in self-censorship. We have to realize that most Chinese users, like most American and other users, are using the web for social purposes, to look at pictures of funny cats and to talk to their friends. They are not trying to get access to the State Department's most recent human rights report or Amnesty International or any of these other things. So, on open, clearly, the U.S. and, and China have a, a different focus. On secure, the Chinese clearly have an interest in protecting uh, their own critical infrastructure, uh, both in communications but also in uh, electrical grids, uh, SCADA control systems. Uh, and just several months ago, a U.S. hacker uh, basically came out and said, well, I've been all throughout the Chinese systems. The Chinese systems are completely vulnerable. Uh, very easy to, to hack, and, and probably a lot of that has to do from the widespread copy, uh, copyright violations and pirating. So most Chinese users pirate software, which means that they're not updating it uh, with the most recent patches. Um, but the Chinese definition of security is different from the one used in the U.S. and, and the West more broadly. In the United States, we refer to cybersecurity, which generally means the defense of these networks uh, and hardware. Uh, China and Russia refers to information security. Right. Information security means both the hardware and content. Right. So if you look at the last week or two weeks ago, uh, Russia, China, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan introduced what they called the International Code of Conduct for Information S Security. Uh, and in it, it talks about uh, content and the use of information technology to threaten the cultural, domestic stability, regime stability of other countries. So this is going to be a major issue in any discussions, negotiations about cyber norms, this difference between information security and cybersecurity, especially as the United States and Secretary Clinton in particular promotes this agenda of Internet freedom. Right? If the U.S. is funding what we are now calling an Internet in a suitcase, right, ways to try to get around uh, cyber, cyber surveillance or cyber controls, uh, for the Chinese, that's the same as a hacker who uh, gets into a defense uh, ministry network. Right? The two are the same. And it is very unlikely that the U.S. is going to control its, what we would call a digital activist or a democracy activist, in return for what we call Chinese patriotic hackers. Right? We're not going to trade off the promotion of freedom for somehow better protection uh, 
uh, on the U.S. side. So this difference of security would be maybe you know, a half or a quarter of the points. And the final is global. Uh, and then here the language is often interoperable. Right? We should have standards that are scalable and interoperable and wide open to everyone. Uh, and here you can see that, again, the Chinese companies could have an interest in this as, as they scale up and as they become global. They have a reason why to ha want to operate on all of these similar shared technology standards. But the Chinese basically see those standards um, as being dominated by the West, by the U.S., Japan, <coughs> European technology companies. And they're afraid they're going to be locked out of them. Right? They're already trying to catch up. And so anytime they see the word interoperable, they're, they're afraid that they're going to be uh, caught out uh, and um, stuck in a technology trap. Uh, I should also point out that the U.S. Uh, and I think most of the West approach to these Governance issues are different than the Chinese approach. The Chinese approach is still very state-centric. The Chinese white paper says that, yes, the Internet is global, but it is an area of state sovereignty just like any other. Uh, and they are more comfortable in dealing uh, in, in forum where the state is the dominant player. The U.S., at least rhetorically and, and more generally, has adopted an approach that we say is like the Internet itself, decentralized and distributed, uh, involving state and non-state actors. Right? So the U.S. has been pushing both the state for, but also places like the ITF, the Internet uh, Task Force, uh, Engineering and Task Force, uh, ICANN, other non-state actors. So we have both these different principles and a different process, a policy process approach uh, to how we're going to work uh, in cyberspace. So broadly, these different interests. Chinese motivation, I think, can be simply stated as the search for political, economic, and military advantage. In all of these realms, the Chinese see themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States as being the weaker power. Uh, and so these all form a asymmetric strategy or a political strategy. So on political hacking, we see this uh, both on an espionage-gathering uh, approach, so attacks on U.S. embassies, Indian embassies, the Dalai Lama, uh, IMF, EU, other, all these other international, international institutions, um, but also as a way of venting uh, nationalistic sentiment within China. So attacks on the Nobel Prize Committee's website, uh, change.org, which was a website that was hosting a petition for the release of Ai Weiwei, the uh, dissident po uh, um, poet and um, uh, <coughs> artist, excuse me. Um, and so part of this is a, acts as a release valve, right? Nationalist sentiment inside China. Uh, how do you let it out? And political hacking of these websites uh, is one of them. Uh, on the military side, in Chinese open source writing, there is a great deal of discussion about information dominance. Uh, the U.S., again, is the, seen as a technologically superior power. How do you degrade that technology? You eliminate U.S. Uh, information superiority. Uh, you would do that through attacks on C4 ISR nodes, uh, command control, computer communications, intelligence surveillance, reconnaissance nodes, uh, which would cyber attacks on those networks as well as attacks on space, so anti-satellite tests, other things, would be used uh, preemptively in many cases or in the first step, right, the idea that the Chinese have to seize the initiative very early in the, in the conflict. Um, and most of this discussion is in the context of a Taiwan scenario, right, so if, if the conflict broke out of the Straits, how would China degrade the U.S. technological capability? Uh, and also slow down logistics. So you could also attack uh, Defense Department networks um, and m slow down, degrade the U.S. response, sailing the ships from J Japan uh, to, to respond to U.S. Uh, military strength. And then finally, on the economic side, China is unhappy being the factor to the world, right? We, we have this conception as China... Uh, economic strength and as an export model, but long term, that's not where the Chinese want to be, right? Uh, the model now is labor intensive, energy intensive, and polluting, uh, and they are afraid they're going to get trapped to being factory to the world. Uh, the model that the Chinese press likes to use is the DVD player. If you turn your DVD player over, 90% of them are made in China. Um, but the optical reader, which is the most technologically sophisticated, are the sophisticated part of the DVD player was probably made by Siemens or Toshiba or some other uh, foreign company. So when that, when that uh, DVD player is sold at Best Buy in the United States for $30, $35, four or five of it goes to the IPR holder, the rest of it goes to the Chinese companies, but 100, 200 DVD producers in China, so the margins are incredibly thin. Right? So the fear is that the Chinese are going to get trapped uh, 
uh, as I mentioned before. And so how do you break out of that? Part of that is just through traditional science and technology policy, increasing spending on R&D, uh, focusing money on technology policy. But the other part clearly seems to be industrial espionage, uh, stealing intellectual property rights, uh, and then uh, giving them in some way, shape, or form uh, to Chinese companies. Of course, the big question um, in all of this is the relationship of the Chinese state uh, to all of these hackers. Right? I, I mentioned at least three ty types of uses of hacking. And you have to imagine that there's a sliding scale. Right? And in a, in a conflict, you can imagine that the use of non-state hackers would, be a, would have some many, major disadvantages for China. Right? It'd be very hard for China to figure out how you're going to signal that you want to de-escalate or, or reduce tensions uh, if patriotic hackers are going off attacking sites on their own. Uh, that said, the widespread assumption is because China controls the internet so tightly that there are very, very few independent, completely independent hackers. Right? It'd be very hard to operate completely independently. Do hackers sometimes do things that the state doesn't want? Probably. Um, do they sometimes act illegally without the state knowing? Probably. But is there some type of contact with some state actor at some point? Probably almost definitely. Uh, we have numerous cases, uh, in the, again, in the open source, where Chinese hackers uh, then provide white hat security services to government agencies, or they are uh, lecturing at universities or providing services to the PLA. Uh, the Financial Times just last week had that piece about cyber militias within private sectors. Uh, so private companies having groups that are somehow tied to the local PLA unit are involved in cyber militia. So there is clearly some relationship. Uh, if that relationship is tolerance, uh, direction, control, uh, I don't think we're exactly sure. Before I um, talk about how the US has been responding to this, let me just say that the Chinese probably, in fact they do, see a high degree of hypocrisy in the US's position. Uh, first of all, they basically believe that the United States, many in the United States, um, are hyping the threat from China. Right. Uh, the China threat, in their view, is part of a military industrial buildup. Uh, it's clearly driven by the, the, the military and Bo Boeing, Raytheon, the other companies that are getting more sp spending into Raytheon, uh, into uh, excuse me, into um, <laughs> cyber uh, weapons and cyber defense. Uh, they also note that it was the United States that first set up uh, the cyber command. Uh, and that it was U.S. strategy, although this is no longer the official strategy, but the official strategy two years ago was to maintain uh, the dominance uh, and deny the use of cyberspace to our adversaries. So we're the ones that are talking about controlling uh, cyberspace. Uh, second, the Chinese believe, and I think they're right, that the U.S. has already highly penetrated all of their networks. I have to assume that the U.S. Uh, probably can get, if more, uh, if not as much, not as much, if not more, from the Chinese than the Chinese are getting from us. Uh, partly, as I mentioned, because uh, if 95% of Chinese uh, government offices are using pirated Windows, uh, and we know how good security is on Windows, uh, and you're using 93 Windows or 95 Windows, again, you have to assume that they are extremely, extremely penetrated. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, they believe that they are totally dependent on U.S. Technologies. So when I meet with Chinese government officials and they complain, you know, what are we supposed to do? We have to rely on Cisco and Oracle and Microsoft, and we know that those companies all provide backdoors to the NSA, then of course our security is very bad. I always say to them, you don't understand, this. that's the same problem for us. We have to rely on Oracle, Microsoft, NSA, and they're hiring Chinese uh, uh, officials, they're hiring Chinese nationals all the time, and we're totally <coughs> worried about the penetration there. But they are completely worried about that. Just paranoia, yes. <laughs> uh, third, the Chinese themselves are a, are a massive victim of cybercrime. Uh, the numbers, again, with the, the, the case of China are, are always hard to say, but the official Chinese numbers last year were 500,000 attacks uh, on Chinese addresses, and 15% of them they trace back to IP addresses in the United States. Again, you know, were U.S. attackers behind that? Who knows? But and from the Chinese view, they're not getting the response that they want. Right? The Chinese official will point to five or six cases where they went to the FBI and said, we want, we want cooperation on these cases, and they got no response uh, from the US government. That is supposedly has, supposed to improve, but that, that is the, the perception that they get there. And finally, I, I should just say that you know, the Chinese probably have uh, larger trends and the future is on their side. Right? But right now, according again to Chinese numbers, there are 500 million Chinese net users. 
Right? So the future of the internet is going to be Asian, if not Chinese. 500 million means you know, there's still 600, 700 million Chinese to get on the web. So the future of the internet is going to be Asian, if not, if not Chinese. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the US response uh, so far. Uh, and it's been mainly in, in three areas. The first, of course, has been uh, at home a series of uh, institutional reforms and, and creations. Uh, the most prominent was the appointing of a cyber czar, uh, Howard Schmidt. Uh, but the fact that it took at least seven months to finally get someone to accept that job, uh, numerous people turned it down before Howard Schmidt finally accepted it, uh, gives you some insight into the limits of the job. Right? Uh, he is the czar, but actually he is a coordinator. Uh, he does not have a very large budget. Uh, he does not have a very large staff. And all he can really do is bring people together. Uh, in public forum, Howard, Howard Schmidt always says that's great. That's exactly what he wants to do. Uh, and he's perfectly happy with that. But there is some real concern that he does not have the power needed to make sure that the institutional agencies that are active in cyber are working together. And there are several bills now uh, in the Congress that would create a new position that would be Senate appointed. Right, a, center, a, a cyber star that had real position. Of course, the White House is not interested in another Senate-appointed uh, job, but those bills are, are working their way through there. The distribution so far has been that the DOD will defend dot .mil uh, networks, so defend military networks. DHS, the Department of Homeland Services, will defend dot .gov uh, and some uh, critical infrastructure networks. And the commercial, the private sector, dot .com is on its own, basically. Um, that has been the general, been the general fallout. From the beginning, there has been real concern um, that the DHS has the expertise to be able to defend the networks, uh, and that the NSA has the expertise but legally should not be involved on domestic networks. Right? The NSA is not supposed to be surveilling U.S. networks, although, of course, we know with the wiretap uh, during the Bush administration that the NSA does not always do what it's supposed to be doing. So right now, the most important progress in coordinating between the two sides has been an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding between DHS and the NSA, where there is now uh, uh, basically uh, DHS officials sitting in NSA and NSA officials sitting in DHS uh, and manning certain sectors together. Um, on the private side, right, the mantra has been information sharing, public-private partnerships and information sharing. Of course, we've been talking about information sharing and public-private partnerships now for at least 25 years. Uh, and there are something like 55 public-private partnerships uh, just in cyber, right? so for specific sectors. So again, the question is coordination. Uh, and while everyone always talks about information sharing, uh, the private sector will make two complaints. Uh, the first is that information sharing just means the private sector giving the government information. Uh, it does not mean adequate sharing from the government side. Uh, and that for most of the private sector, that information is a competitive advantage. Right? So if you talk to the ISPs, to AT&T and Verizon and other companies, they'll say, why am I going to share this information? This is a competitive advantage for me. Security is one of my differentials. Uh, so why am I going to share this, this information with both my competitors and with, my, um, and with the government? There are also liability issues that are in, in play. Uh, there has been some progress on the defense, uh, protecting defense uh, industries. So there is a pilot program in place that does in information sharing. Basically, the U.S. government shares target signatures uh, with the defense base. Uh, I hear, quite honestly, I hear mixed things. The government seems to say that it is a success. The defense sector to, said to me was completely skeptical um, that there were actually was anything that was being achieved. Uh, but this program is supposed to be expanded. Uh, now I think it involves 20 pilots. It's going to expand to 40. And there's been some talk about moving it out to actually other high tech companies. <coughs> Uh, so that is on the d domestic side. That's the main uh, breakdown there. Of course, the other main push is on the defense side, as I mentioned, the, the, the establishment of cyber command. So making this a military issue, making this almost in many ways an existential issue, an attack that is a threat uh, on the U.S. national security, clearly signals uh, its intelligence, uh, its importance to the U.S. Uh, policy structure. Uh, the, the Defense Department released its, uh, also its national strategy uh, just a, a few months ago. Uh, not, uh, notably lacking from that defense strategy is any talk of offensive operations, uh, how the U.S. might conduct them, how the U.S. thinks about them. Uh, there is a very strong deterrent factor, both in the Defense Department strategy and in the international 
cyber strategy, which basically says the U.S. reserves the right to, with, to reply to a cyber attack with any means necessary, uh, kinetic, cyber, or whatever other types of diplomatic, economic. Um, or as someone told the Wall Street Journal, you take down an electric power grid, we put a missile down your smokestack. Um, but how that would actually work is completely unclear. Uh, Cross-domain uh, deterrence, as we know from the nuclear field, is always very difficult. Uh, how do you make a credible threat? Most of the attacks are espionage, which is not actually against international law. Uh, and it's very unlikely that we would put a missile down someone's smokestack for a cyber espionage attack. Um, offensive operations, there was a, a piece in the New York Times today, as uh, Katrina pointed out to me, about the U.S. considered using uh, cyber weapons against Libya in the beginning stages to take out uh, missile uh, and other intelligence gathering things. Uh, legally, we decided against it, uh, partly for one reason I don't understand about hostility, the, the, the use of the... Of, um, the War Powers Act, but the other was we didn't want to, we didn't want to set the norm of being the first to use it uh, in an offensive operation. So a lot of discussion still going on about what the U.S. believes is legal uh, and who has the legal right to use these weapons uh, on the offensive side. And then uh, the third and final area is uh, international engagement. Uh, the U.S. in the State Department that there is now a coordinator also on cyber, Chris Painter, who is in charge of international strategy. Um, we have uh, pushed forward on many, many fora. Uh, we have basically stated that we don't believe there should be new, new treaties or new laws uh, in cyberspace, that the existing ones uh, sh should be applicable. So the Buddhist Best Convention, the European Con Convention on Cybercrime, we, we want to expand that. Uh, the international laws of war and conflict, we believe uh, cyber already falls under. Uh, there needs to be some discussion about to clarify, but we believe that they're there. Uh, and the United States is engaging on a whole range of multiple, multiple forum about what the laws, the rules of, rules of the road, the norms should be in, in cyberspace about cyber behavior. But I would say the most important um, pushes have been on the bilateral and multilateral side. So uh, the, the recent agreement uh, announcement with Australia that cyber attacks fall under the ANSYS Treaty, uh, UK-US agreement, discussions on cyber, uh, US engagement of NATO, um, Japan, India, all these other places. And I would say long term, the most important thing probably is capacity building. So as Asia, Latin America, Africa come online, security expertise is fairly thin. Uh, and those people are going to have to look for help. Uh, if the US, the West, Europe is not there, the Chinese will be there. Uh, and Chinese help comes with both a kind of view of how the open the web should be domestically, but also these international norms that don't really, um, I think, push in the same way that we want to go. So those are all the, um, the kind of main things. I should say that one part of international engagement is also naming and shaming. So occasionally the US will explicitly say, we think the Chinese are behind these attacks. Uh, it happens actually much less often than you'd, you'd imagine. The prominent cases have been um, with this change.org, as I mentioned before, IYA, the State Department actually raised the concern with the, with the Chinese. And then just last week, uh, the Mike Rogers of the Senate Intelligence Committee, excuse me, the House Intelligence Committee, said the Chinese are behind these attacks. This is a, the largest transfer technology, illegal transfer technology in the history. But there have not been very many public uh, announcements and calling out. Uh, I suspect we'll see that moving forward. But part of the problem is that companies don't want to talk about it. Um, companies don't want to be both exposed to the liability issues. They don't want to expose their own vulnerabilities. They don't want to be open themselves up to retribution from the Chinese government, right? If you start claiming the Chinese government is behind this, uh, the SEC has just said that there is now a breach law, so companies will have to be more vocal and transparent about it. That I think is going to be uh, a good thing. What I expect from the, the all of the discussions with the Chinese is very little. Uh, I don't see any any reason why uh, the intensity and number of Chinese attacks will go down. Uh, quite honestly, it, it's just the benefits are too high and the costs are way too low. Uh, and I don't see that changing dramatically anytime soon. I think there will be, there, we are already discussing cybersecurity with the Chinese um, at the Strategic and Economic Dialogue and Admiral Mullen and Joint Chiefs had a discussion with his counterpart in China. We'll have some discussions like we have with the Russians about mm -hmm. points of contact, crisis communication. Uh, we might get some uh, discussions about red lines uh, in a cyber attack, what, 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 what we might consider a threshold. Uh, 
uh, for an actual armed con conflict. But other than that, we're not really going to get uh, very much uh, traction with the Chinese. And you can see that, I think, in the, the run-up to this conference in London. Right? The last three weeks, uh, between the Chinese introducing this international information code and reading the Chinese newspapers, where almost every day there is an article about uh, the U.S. search for hege hegemony in cyberspace, uh, conflict is almost inevitable in cyberspace. That they're, they're really um, seeing this as an area of, of conflict and competition. So that's the pessimistic ending. Let me give you why things might change, but as I said, my heart's not really in it. Um, the, the first is, right now, China clearly sees the United States as, as being more vulnerable than it is. Right? The U.S. military, the U.S. economy are both more dependent on IT than, than China is. But you could see over time, as both the PLA modernizes and the Chinese economy continues to grow, that they reach a similar level of vulnerability. Right? As I said, it's clear that they are very uh, vulnerable, that it's probably very easy for the U.S. to hack into it. Once you get some mutual level of vulnerability, then you start having shared interests. You can start talking about protecting critical infrastructure uh, and uh, perhaps the Internet itself. Right? No side has any uh, incentives to bring the Internet itself down, uh, I suppose, there. Second, um, I've been using China as a unitary actor, but of course it is not. Um, and so there are competing interests within China. You can see this clearly on the technology and innovation side. So my other work uh, focuses on how China thinks it's going to move itself up the, the, the value chain, and I've talked about that briefly, but the Chinese now have a policy that's called indigenous innovation. How do you uh, move up that value chain? And a lot of that is uh, forced technology transfer, access to the Chinese market for U.S. and foreign companies to transfer technology. But there are those in China who don't think that it's a very good strategy, that a more mercantilist, closed view towards technology is not in China's long-term interest, and they have a more open view. I have to imagine that on the cyber side, there are similar views, that there are those who think that cyber espionage is not good for the Chinese economy and puts to risk some extremely important relations with the European Union and the, and the United States, and, and is that in China's long-term interest. So you can imagine that domestically there are debates going on and that perhaps uh, U.S. rhetoric, EU rhetoric, West Wind rhetoric could help shift those debates. Um, and then third and finally, um, for status concerns, tr China does not like being outside global norms. I mean, that, that has been the trend uh, across a whole range of international issues. Proliferation is probably the best example. It's been incomplete, but if you look at what China has, where China has moved in the 80s and 90s, uh, and looking at missile cells and nuclear cooperation with Iran and Pakistan and North Korea. Again, it's not perfect, but it's certainly much better than it was. So if you could get to some agreed norms, um, both, I think, first with the U.S. and its friends, then reaching out to Brazil, South Africa, uh, the other major Internet powers, it's going to be very hard for China to be outside of it. Um, but those are all a lot of ifs, uh, and I don't see any of them happening in the short term. So I would say... The future is going to be a, a lot more, or the same amount, or and more, you know, somewhere between more and the same, uh, this kind of constant kind of cyber irritation. Um, discussion of the norms is important, but unlikely to make any short-term changes. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.